today we're going to talk about a little room and essentially this is what a little room looks like. It is a three walled structure with a plexiglass top and the objects are hanging from all sides of the structure as well as from the top. What it allows for is it gives blind infants and kiddos with visual impairments as well as children with slow development or kiddos with significant disabilities in their gross motor areas or combinations of areas to gain the ability to reach to start to understand where they are in space and early object concepts such as comparing objects, knowing where those objects are located and understanding that I can create object movement. If you see here, these are just different objects that could be located in a little room. They have different textures, different structures, different colors. This little room specifically is made out of PVC pipe. I will also link down below the pre-made little rooms from the creator of little rooms, Dr. Lily Nielsen. She does recommend that you only utilize the standardized version of the little rooms that is created by her. My experience with a vision therapist, they created their own. So that's kind of what I'm gonna show here. This specific style, the PVC pipes, the walls and the plexiglass were all attached together using those Velcro strips. Dr. Nielsen's version of the little room, the plexiglass top actually is added afterwards. My favorite thing about the little room is that it's only to be utilized during adult direct supervision, but that the plexiglass top allows for you to see kind of what the kiddo is doing, what their purposeful movements are, and how they're moving their body, which will then allow you to understand what grasps or movement patterns are emerging with this kiddo because it allows for a safe environment for the child to independently explore. Let's still talk a little bit about why we would choose to utilize a little room and why it's important. So first you're gonna look at object manipulation. Object manipulation is essentially the child's ability to grasp, locate, hit, slash bat, or bring an object to their mouth. When you manipulate an object, it's essentially purposeful motion or exploration of an environment. The other really important thing we're gonna talk about is independent exploration. What the little room provides is a safe, place for kiddos with visual impairments or kiddos who need a lot of help or assistance in order to navigate their environment, like they're in supported sitting, maybe they lack head control. And the little room is a safe place for them to explore and their environment, start to connect the dots and feel comfortable in utilizing a different pattern of movement that's away from their body or themselves. So they're looking at some of these foreign objects like measuring spoons or beads or a ball that's suspended from the ceiling and they're starting to feel more comfortable with alternative things in their environment versus just what is attached to their body like their fingers or their toes or their feet. What it also does is it allows for again that adult to supervise the child but they're again still independent and so kiddos with visual impairments or kiddos with gross motor delays they're not necessarily having that same experience as kiddos who are typically developing because they're not crawling under the couches they're not able to maybe get that visual input in order for them to know where an object is in space it takes them longer processing time because they're lacking one of the most fundamental ways we gain information about our environment or ourselves or objects surrounding us. And so again, this kind of decreases any anxiety, increases their comfort level and allows them to learn at their pace. 
Other aspects of the little room include the differences between object permanence and object comparison. Object comparison is essentially taking two objects that are the same in one aspect but different in others. So for example, you could have things that differ by size. So measuring spoons. You could have like a fourth of a teaspoon. You could have a half of a teaspoon. And what's cool about these measuring spoons is that if you bang them together, they may also make noise, which is a different sensory component, as well as they can touch them to determine the different size. And so that starts to increase their tactile discrimination. Object comparison in a different aspect, so not just size, you could have texture. So you might have like the same half teaspoon, but you might have it in metal and wood and plastic. So the metal is gonna be colder than maybe the wood would be. The wood's gonna have a different grain or it's not gonna be quite as smooth as the plastic. So the kiddo is starting to realize like, okay, this is the same size, but it can be different based on how it feels. Object permanence on the other hand is gonna be about understanding that when you can't see an object, it still exists. It's a cognitive level that happens in typically developing kiddos in infant you play peekaboo and they actually think you disappear or you hide a ball behind your back, maybe it's annoying the dog or something like that, and then the kiddo forgets about it, they think it just disappeared, it doesn't exist anymore. As opposed to a kiddo that's a little bit older, you put a ball behind their back and they're trying to get it because they understand that the, that object still exists. The little room is a way to allow kiddos to understand that just because I'm not touching an object or I can't see an object doesn't mean that it has officially cease to exist. Another aspect that the little room demonstrates is the concept of cause and effect. So essentially say you have little bells. So this is that bells equals the object. The sensory aspect of cause and effect is if I push the bells, then they create noise. So for a kiddo trying to understand that what I do can affect the world around me. You have the object, which is the bells, and then you have the cause and effect. Push equals noise. Another option of cause and effect could be movement of the object itself in space. If a ball is suspended from the ceiling by an elastic cord, if the kiddo pulls on the ball, then the ball will go back up. So kind of it will essentially recoil in movement. The part that of cause and effect that's so important is that it results in purposeful movement. And that's what we want the kiddos to start to understand is if I do something, there is an effect Effect on my environment and that improves a kiddo's willpower to really produce independent movement. Other areas that the little room addresses are spatial memory. So if we have, say, here is the little room and here is our little person and they're laying on their back. So that means that this is the left side of their body and this is the right side of the body. And say we again have those like little bells that are just kind of hanging here. The kiddo might remember, hey, I want that noise. I want to recreate that bell. And they're gonna reach with their left hand to the left side to create that ringing noise by the bells. That itself is spatial memory if they do it repeatedly and they seem to like that motion or that noise and they start to understand, okay, it's on this side of my body. I need to move this arm to equal that noise and locate the bells in order to do that. So spatial memory is really important, especially with kiddos with visual impairment, because that's gonna start 
to incorporate their ability to cognitively understand where a location is in space and how they can move their body to get to said location. The other two areas that are really important are sensory integration slash motor planning. So motor planning is essentially, if we use this top example, motor planning is the movement of the arm affecting the noise. It is the purposeful movement. It is a want or a desire in the brain sending a signal to an arm to produce a purposeful movement to affect that desired noise movement effect, essentially. The sensory integration piece would be the noise going back into the auditory section, the brain realizing, okay, I like that noise or I don't like that noise, and then being able to kind of understand what that noise is and then also just tolerate it. Sometimes where you see sensory integration in a little room being a little bit difficult is the actual duration of being able to tolerate time in the little room. So initially, if the kiddo is struggling with sensory integration, they may only last 10 minutes. As they are provided access to a little room, it may increase to 20 minutes and then potentially even up to like 30, 45 minutes, even 60 minutes, depending on what you have available. The little room, the kiddos are able to go in and out, move in and out of the little room. It gives them control over their environment. So if they do decide that they're done, then that's okay. You can stop the little room experience at that point. That sensory integration is gonna be through objects that have a noise making component, objects that have different textures, objects that are different colors. So even if a kiddo doesn't have full loss of their vision, they can start to train that head control, that eyeball strengthening, start to be engaged with objects with a shiny component or maybe a reflective component, things like that. So let's go back and let's talk about some of the specifics of the little room 